uh, uh, regarding the staircase video, I was just wondering what would happen if they get a musical escalator. <laughs> well, I am I'm very honored to be here speaking to uh, a very eclectic crowd at the Champollion Foundation. It's not always, a, you know, artists are not invited for this kind of things very often because people are afraid they will arrive drunk. <laughs> in in the most cases, they actually do. And artists, I'm not drunk. <laughs> and, uh, and I will be, though. <laughs> artists, uh, in most cases, they make a uh, very poor speakers, you know. I, I am very touched by the fact that you came here to hear, uh, well, I don't know, I don't go to very many neuroscience uh, conferences, <laughs> but I, to hear an artist, you know. I have insomnia problems, and that's how I solve it. For me, art uh, lectures are very therapeutic that way. I, I kept thinking, you know, there are many, many stories about scientists and artists. One of them is related in Richard Feynman's uh, Are You Kidding, Rich, uh, Mr. Feynman? Uh, the Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, physicist uh, starts an adventure with the artist Robert Irving. And they, for three weeks, they discuss the possibilities of collaboration, you know. And then at one point, he says that Robert never learned anything about science, and I learned, and I was, uh, started to draw nude women in, uh, you know, uh, the, this clubs, you know, they, he started doing that thing after he got it. So it, it just the collaboration never really took them anywhere. And I think uh, uh, one of the reasons is that because we tend to look at the world in different directions. You know, neuroscientists are, scientists are interested in how everybody's brain work. And I can't, I just can't get enough of, to find out how my brain works. And, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a very broad subject in itself. Uh, I on, often, when I'm in front of a crowd and I see this funnel, you know, me talking to a whole bunch of people, I can't help but thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> and I tell you, since I'm here, and you can see what I do at the, uh, I don't have those great graphics that you had. This is the last image. Well, how it, we gotta go back. We gotta go to the first image. You know, otherwise, I won't have anything to talk. Um, how? What am I doing here? It's a long story. And then I, you know, you can see what I do at the Centro de Belen, as it was mentioned. And you can buy the book and buy the T-shirt, and you know. But um, I am here for many, many reasons. I'm here because I was born in Brazil. If I was born anywhere else, probably I wouldn't be here. I was born in a poor household in the mid middle of Sao Paulo, and if I was born rich, probably I wouldn't be here. I was born with, in a household where both my parents worked, and my grandmother uh, was an amazing woman. Her name was Ana Rocha. She learned how to read by herself. Nobody knows how she did it. She, looked so, she never had one day at school, but she looked so hard at her children, children's books that somehow, in the chaos of science, she started to discover an order. And she started reading. She read uh, science books. She read the history uh, of Brazil. She read bot botany books. And, and she was a very inspiring woman for me. She was the most influential person in my entire life because my earliest memory, I am sitting with her in an old gray sofa. And she holds my hand and we go over the words as if she was teaching me Braille. And she tells the names that were in those words, like an enchantment, like you would be... Anaconda, Cascavel, Urutu, and I would savor the taste of those words, even though they, they were names of Brazilian snakes. I remember reading at the age of four or five, and by the, eight, by the time I was seven, I was reading uh, the, the Voyage to the Center of the Earth and Treasure Island, and I was sure to be a hit at school, but something really weird happened. <coughs> I started reading by the phonosyllabic version, started uh, being taught how to read by the phonosyllabic. It took me two years to learn how to write. I discovered that I could not only, I was unable to read uh, or to write, but I was unable also to read certain fonts, that I was unable to read cursive language because I had learned how to read by memorizing the entire shape of the words, like I was a self-taught dyslexic person. 
And I, I, it took me so long to read. By the time most kids abandoned this very intense and, and relationship that's not affected by attention at all with the visual world, that it's strong and continuous exercise of the right side of the brain. Uh, when they start to abandon that for a more departmentalized, more compartmentalized uh, type of relationship to the world through language, through written and spoken language, they start, stop, they stop, uh, abandon gradually drawing and, and Play-Doh playing, clay uh, structures. And I took the opposite direction because I could not write or read. I started drawing. And I remember by in the second year of school, my copy books were, looked like the, the Egyptian section of the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <laughs> when I started uh, creating a sort of shorthand, whenever I could not uh, know a word, I would just make a quick drawing. In these quick drawings, because of, uh, they started becoming more and more elaborate to the point that at about 12, I was the kid that sits in the back and make caricatures of the teachers and pass them along <laughs> the, the, their friends. Being uh, the guy who draws, you know, in school got me not only in trouble, but also got me this, a lot of curiosity about why did we draw? Why was this thing that got, it, it was so compulsive, you know? And at 14, I got a scholarship. Uh, I went to, the public schools had a big event, I remember that day. And I got a scholarship to learn live drawing. In, uh, in, a, in an academic school. Nobody knew who Andy Warhol was there, but they knew who Titian was. And, they, they, and for a 14-year-old to go every day after school to draw naked people, it was amazing. I never missed one class. I was there every day. <laughs> Drawing a lot got me also in, the, in questioning why what are representations? Why do we see an entire world you know, beyond us just by looking at a flat piece of paper? And that was, you know, it's a, I was talking to Hui, it was my initial idea was to become a psychologist. I got hold of some very rudimentary translations of James Jerome Gibson, um, The Senses Perceived, which was a classic book on perception that he wrote as a, as a I think it was uh, as a re by request of the, the Air Force because they were starting to try to improve the interface of jet planes. And I, I thought that I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to learn how people see things. And I tried the vestibular twice for the University of Sao Paulo. I didn't pass. I was a poor student. And then I decided to go into advertising. Because it was everything that I was interested in, representation, psychology. I like to fool people. But, you know, and it was another book called Subliminal Seduction, which they tell about all the things that people did at that time. They were, they were airbrushing naked people in ice cubes in whiskey commercials. I wanted to go into the advertising not because I wanted to sell whiskey. I wanted to sell ice. And uh, I, I discovered that soon because I, the first three or four weeks, I thought that I knew everything already. And I started to think of how, and I needed, uh, the, the teacher said that I need, we needed a personal project. I was always, I always suspected that I was, uh, I had reading problems when I was driving on the streets of Sao Paulo in the 70s, because I could not read anything, you know. And I, once I was with my mother in the car, we, I went there to get a payment at the bank, and I said, Mom, can you read that? And then she said, no. And then I went around the block, and I went, I was going at 40, I went at 30. And I said, now, can you read that? She said, no. And I went at 20. And I did that with all my friends, and I did that with different signs for about six months. And that was, how, that was my thesis <laughs> for the first year. I created a chart that crossed vectors of angle of approach, right, speed and size of text, to improve the readability of billboards. And, uh, you know, they would... They would make billboards in Sao Paulo, on the jockey club. On the right side, you know, they would, they would advertise toys on the right side. So you would have to be a driving baby who can read backwards and an incredible speed to buy that doll. <laughs> you know, and it would be, everything was wrong. And I realized that I could read, 
but nobody, I, I, I couldn't read, but nobody else could. So I got a job. Uh, in a, there were only two companies that deal with outdoors at that time, and I got a job in one of them. And I also got, uh, was awarded a really ugly plexiglass trophy for the study that I did from the Sao Paulo Association of Advertisement. The day, now we get to the point why I'm really here talking to you. The day I went to pick up the trophy, I didn't know anybody. I had a beer, I got the trophy, and I went out of the event. Uh, I, when I got the car, I went to where, around, and I was in front of this event. <coughs> I witnessed a fight. A woman stopped the car and said, the guy's killing my boyfriend. I get out of the car, and one guy was killing the other, really, hitting the other with breast knuckles. And I went there, and I broke the fight apart. It was a black tie event. Everybody was wearing black tie. And I saw these two guys wearing tuxedos, fighting. It was pretty funny, you know? <laughs> Looked like a movie. So I went there, I broke the fight apart, and on my way to my car, I heard an explosion, and I realized that I was hit. I was on the floor. The guy who was the victim couldn't see anything, got into his car, picked up a gun, and tried to shoot the first person wearing a tuxedo that he saw. That person was I. Luckily, it wasn't fatal, as you can you see. <laughs> and even more luckily, the guy was rich. So the guy uh, uh, not only paid my medical bills, but he also gave me money, who I used to buy a ticket to go to New York in 1982. And that's primarily the main reason why I'm talking to you today, is because I got shot in the leg. <clears throat> I, 